Okay, good morning, afternoon, and good evening, depending on your location. Um, welcome to the uh, VIA Learning Product Training with a Blended Approach. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for, for, for joining us and making time for this. We're, I'm confident we're going to have a very interesting uh, interesting session, and we do look to have this as a, a dialogue between us all, so please do feel free to, uh, to use the chat features and ask questions as we go through. We, we strongly encourage that. So the folks that I have with me, um, my name is introduce myself for your moderator today. I'm Darren McGarry. Um, I actually work um, with, with uh, VIA Learning uh, in a sales capacity. Uh, I also have with me um, Julie Brink, our Director of eLearning of VIA Learning. Julie. Hi. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I'm Julie Brink, like Darren said. I'm Director of eLearning uh, here at VIA Learning, and I come to be learning with over 15 years of experience in training and development. In the last six of those years, I've been um, focusing on e-learning and multimedia training in that space. Um, also on the phone, we have Lance Dublin. And Lance, can you are you able to speak yet? Uh, yeah. Do you hear me now? Yeah. There we go. Welcome. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody went silent. I thought it was something I had said. <laughs> Our, um, attendees today. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lance Dublin, uh, calling in from San Francisco, California. Um, I've been in the learning and development industry some 30 odd years, uh, starting out uh, in academia and then moving into corporate learning and development. I uh, spent the last uh, 12 years doing independent consulting work. 15 years before that, I had a design and development company. So I've sort of seen a large, lot of things happen in our industry. And Looking forward to the webinar today. Great, thank you, Lance, and uh, th th thank you for, uh, for for attending with us. We we, we sincerely appreciate that. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, the agenda today. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of these already, but today we're going to walk away um, and, and have some discussion points around what this new model is. Um, you know, it is it is in, in change, it is in flux, and we want to you know make sure that we're all on the same page as to what that is and how that changes. Um, we're going to be taking a look at what the what the business case is for this stuff? You know, is, is there a solid business case that you can make to, to the, um, the stakeholders in your organization that, to promote this and, and, and acquire those dollars to, to do it? And then I want to take a look at some, like I said, there's a lot of change going on. So I want to take a look at some of the trends. I know that um, you know, both Julie and Lance have some, some interesting viewpoints on those. And then finally, I want to take a look at what is success in this space? What does that look like and how is that defined? And you know, is, that, is, is that mapped and how can you do that? And then, like I said earlier, we're going to have a Q&A, so please um, do, you know, do send those questions in. I, I very, very much encourage uh, interaction as much as possible. And to get us underway and to start that interaction, um, I'm going to ask you guys a question. So um, one of the things that we thought we'd do is there'll be a series of polls as we go through this as well and get overall viewpoints from the audience. So the question we have, do you currently deliver training with multiple delivery methods? So that's yes, we do obviously. No, we definitely don't. Or you know, it really depends on the content. Some cases it's appropriate, and uh, some cases it's not. So go ahead and make your vote right now, and we'll uh, we'll see these results. It looks like they're coming in as we speak. Not many of you saying no, so that's that's encouraging. So this is something that you guys are already heavily engaged in, um, and it looks like we have. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close that poll. So <clears throat> the results are: fifty percent of you said yes. Uh, Six percent um, said no, so there's a few out there that, that aren't doing this today. So we'll hopefully, uh, you know, garner some interest and, and create some interesting points for you guys to, to talk with your teams about. And then 44 percent, sometimes really depending on the content. Um, so that's that's good. So there's a, a large group of you already doing this. So let's go ahead to the uh, to, to, to the first subject, knowing the uh, the new blended learning model. So um, Lance, perhaps you can uh, you, you can kick us off with. Uh, getting an understanding of, of what this new blended learning model really is about. Great. Thanks, Darren. Again, I want to th thank the VIA Learning folks for inviting me to be here this morning. I want to start out with some context and, and before we jump in and look at what, you know, what's old and what's new. And I want to start here. You can see the graphic on the screen. You know, in the next 10 minutes, I'd like to re have you really sort of suspend your mental model about what you believe blended learning is or isn't. You know, if you look on the left, there's the guy with the square peg looking for the round hole, and on the right, there's, uh, there's a guy with a one-size-fits-all pants. I think we all come to this conversation of blended learning with our own definition in our minds of what it is or isn't. So for the next few minutes, just like you to suspend that mental model and sort of 
go with me as I sort of tour through what's happening in learning, what's happened in the past, and what's happening in the future. So let's look at what learning looks like uh, on this next slide. We have over in the lower left, you have uh, the, the cave family. I don't actually know them, but that's a, an image of what I believe uh, they could look like. And up there in the top right, you see the, on the modern uh, Western family. Uh, and I want you to just think of in a minute, uh, think for a minute, how did the cave baby in that lower left family learn to walk versus how did the cave, uh, the cave baby, how did the baby in the modern American family learn to walk? And you see with the, as I've linked these together, basic learning hasn't really changed. The, the cave baby, you know, struggled along on the ground, so did the, the modern American baby. The cave baby reached up onto a rock and tried to stand up, and so did the modern American baby, but they, they reached up onto a chair. Uh, parents were encouraging. They were listening for signs. They were watching the people around them work. So if you look at the next graphic, it's going to appear, you see that, that learning has these principles. We're always seeking inputs. That's not new. It's, it's not a change. We've always done that. We've always, in our mind, tried to organize those inputs into some mo mental model for ourselves. We've then always then tried to apply those in a classroom that meant taking a test. In real life, it meant sort of trying it out. And then based on what happened, we sort of evaluated the results. And then we went and got additional inputs, and we organized again, and we applied again, and we evaluated again. And you know, this, I know this is a very simplified model, but one of the points I want to make here is learning itself hasn't changed. Nothing has changed how we learn. What's changing is how we enable learning, how we extend learning, and how we enhance learning. I'm going to look at the next slide here. We're going to see Bloom's taxonomy. I don't know how many of you have read Benjamin Bloom's work, but I think it's really excellent. On the left-hand side, you see what's quote, unquote, the old version, and the right side of the 90s, somebody updated the version. But if you start at the bottom and you work your way up, you realize you know, not all learning requirements are the same. Sometimes all we're trying to do is remember something. And I think you could pretty much say the, the search engines have really helped us there, you know, typing in zip codes, area codes, facts, you know, whatever. Sometimes, you know, if you move your way up this pyramid, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, trading, you know, I don't think we can argue that this still is, still is relevant. It may change the words, but the point is learning hasn't changed. Sometimes you need to learn for knowledge and sometimes for comprehension, sometimes to apply, sometimes to synthesize, sometimes to create. So again, learning, fundamentals of learning change, and the kind of taxonomy of what we're learning hasn't changed. Let's go on and look at something else we need to consider when we're, we're moving into this whole area of blended learning, which is audiences. And now on the left, you see all the pictures, you know, starting at the top, Nelson Mandela. And we have, of course, Dennis Hopper representing my generation, the 50s. We have uh, the wonderful Matrix family there from the X generation. And actually, now people are talking about five generations, the millennials and the 2020s. I have, my son, I have a son in the 2020s. And what just filled in there were some you know, buzzwords about what these generations represent. I get a lot of feedback when I, when I present where people say, you know, generations are stereotypes, and we shouldn't accept them. I agree with that. But they give us some sense of how people are going to accept and adopt and leverage certain technologies. But if we, if we group these, you'll see what's going to build up here on the slide in a second. The, I'm sure you've heard this phrase, digital immigrants and digital natives. You know, the truth is, I didn't grow up. When I grew up, I didn't have a cell phone. My child had a cell phone. Yeah, you know, when he was eight, I didn't have one. I didn't have a computer until I was in my 20s or 30s. He had one when he was five. There is a difference in terms of your sort of general thinking about technology if it's something that you've grown up with versus something you've had to learn to do. Uh, best example of that was my grandmother who had, my mother, my son's grandmother, when, when we got her email, she would start every email with, the, you know, the, 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 she'd open up the email and then would put in the date, the two, you know, to Lance Dublin, Dublin Consulting, da, 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 then Dear Lance, she would, write, she would write a formal letter inside the email. Because to her, that was what her mental model was. You know, as an immigrant, that was, you know, she was thinking a digital immigrant. I'm writing a letter and the technology is sending it. Well, as you all know, uh, that's probably not the best uh, use of email right now to, to put all that in because it's in the headers. It's already contained. You don't need to do that. I mean, people struggle with you even have to put you know a salutation in it because it's sort of obvious that who it's going to. So this is just sort of part of the backdrop of the notion that these that the immigrants are different than those kids, young people. I shouldn't say kids, 20s to 30s, who've grown up with the technology in a native way. As we'll see in the next slide. What's really key about this quote-unquote native population 
is their, the degree in which they are social. And I know this is an overused word, but if you sort of start at the right and then look at this, the graphic, you know, I, ASTD and I4CP, two wonderful companies, have done a, did a study, and, and this, you, know, you can just read this quickly. It took the radio intelligence 38 years, and then 13 years to reach 50 million users. It took Facebook less than nine months to reach 100 million users. Actually, in two years, they reached 500 million. That's you know a huge number. iPhone applications hit 1 billion in nine months. You know all the statistics, the number of iPads that were sold, the number of Twitter messages. I mean, all of this has happened not because of the boomers, not because of the great generation. It really has been happening because of the millennials. If you sort of shift your attention to the, to the graphic which comes from that study, you can see from the bars that the, the, the yellow, the light yellow represents the millennials. And look at their heavy usage of the social technology. I mean, they really are the drivers of it. Now, I text and I instant message and, I, and I, I'm on all the social networks, but not to the degree to which my son is and not to the degree to which uh, a lot of the younger, you know, the, the generations of, that have sort of grown up with it are. Uh, I know people say, but Facebook is growing in the, the boomer and the older generation. That's true, it's growing, but the traffic is still largely in the so very social generation. Let's look at another thing that's, tr that's true, and this is about, about context. You know, the, if you look at some of the, the light green boxes, you know, time and place hasn't changed. We still have time, there's a clock, we still have place. Now right now, it's 11, 12 San Francisco time. I'm not sure what time zone you're in but it could be another time. I'm in San Francisco, you wherever you are, and we're meeting in you know, the same time, but we're not meeting in the same place. So all this happened before. So if you sort of look at this slide, you'll see time and place is really shifting because social media is linked this to sort of any time and any place. It really doesn't matter anymore where somebody is or what time it is. Because of the technologies that allow us to link together, and especially the social technologies, time and place is really getting very you know, I, w I want to say it's not going away as an issue, but it's dropping into the background uh, because it's not something that we have to consider anymore when we think about being in contact with someone or in that way, in that sense, setting up a learning activity. And you'll see this exploding slide that's going to show up next on your screen. The say the social media landscape. This is uh, I wish I could remember who I collected this from, so I apologize if, I, if it was from, from one of you. But if you start off the outer circle categorize, context, connect, converse, communicate, collect, change, collaborate. I love all these Cs. Uh, you know, this is what the world is doing using the social media tools that are then on that inner circle. And the reason that this is you know, sort of what we're all talking about now is that this is the most fundamental change we've had to the technologies uh, for a while. I don't know if going to debate on it, but it's been a fundamental shift that's, al that's allowed us to do these things, categorize, converse, communicate in ways we haven't been able to do them before. None of these things are new on those outer circles. What's yeah. new is the degree to which we can do them in a seamless way uh, and the way can set, blend them into our learning activities. So like about every minute or two it goes away? Thank, thanks for that, Lance. It sounds, if, 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 um, one of the questions that, the, 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 that I had on this, Lance, is really with the, um, <clears throat> the the old versus the new. Have there been any studies that show how the you know the new blended learning model is more or less effective than the kind of the more traditional instructor-led type training in a classroom? Thanks, Darren. Actually, the, what's interesting is the only studies they have done have not focused on the media. Has found out that the media actually is irrelevant. That what what drives design what drives retention in learning is design. So you can design for a classroom and have a highly effective activity. You can design for a mobile phone and have a highly effective activity. It's not the technology that matters. What matters is the design for the appropriate content, meaning that you probably wouldn't want to have someone learn how to do heart surgery, a basic heart surgery, on a you know, two-inch mobile phone. Bad choice of nature. Um, so I think that one of the things that gets people confused is that it's sort of like you know, Marshall McLuhan, the media and the message. The media is not what's important. What's important is link the content to the audience, to the design, and then choose, and I think that's why they call it the, the sort of new blending. We just have more choices, more colors in our palette. Right. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. I guess it makes it harder as well on, on you know, us and the, and the audience in making sure that we're selecting the correct content for the correct audience and delivering it with the, with, with the correct media.
media message that's um, medium that's, that's really going to have um, the most effect for that audience. Right, and I think when we when we go on and look at some more of the choices we have, then and then Julie's going to pick up. I think we'll, this will all you know we'll just add more more detail to this as we go forward. Great, good. Well, let's 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 start doing exactly that. Um, uh, so it's, next thing we look at is you know foundations and what's old is new. Right. So if we pop up to the next slide, I think one of the things that we were bringing up, we were talking about learning, right? Learning hasn't changed. So if we pop to the next slide, you're going to see the, the, this E up here. here. Uh, you know, if we could all talk, I'd ask you, you know, how you would pronounce this. But notice the E is not in front of the word. So it's not e-learning. This is learning to the power of E. What's really shifted is what we can use to enable, enhance, and extend learning, which I was speaking about a few minutes before. So we look at this next slide. You know, we, we, today is just we're on a continuum of changes. You know, we saw first. You know, with, when we get back to the cave family, you know, right? You know, the first scratchy on rocks helped people to draw pictures, and that helped us to learn. Then when we move to the next, you know, we had the great Greek Socratic lecturers. Then we moved on to the pen. You know, another great learning technology. Then we moved on to the printing press. Probably you know, many people think probably one of the greatest technologies. That we've ever had, and then you know things went on. You're going to see here the telegraph, you know, changed how we communicated. Then we moved to the telephone. Then we moved to the television. You know, all of these change not learning, but our ability to enable, extend, and enhance it. And then let's jump ahead into the computer era and see that you know the computer era has been tremendous even since the the 70s. We started out with mainframes and computer-assisted instruction. We moved to personal computers and computer-based training. We moved on to you know when we had hard disks and video uh, video cards, interactive multimedia. Then the internet hit around you know the year 2000. We started out with web-based training, and now today you know we're talking about web 2.0, e-learning and learning 2.0, and and it's not stopping there. So I think what's really important, what we're talking about, is that to be in being responsible as a learning professional in today's world, you have to really be using all the tools that you have. Uh, at your disposal, and this leads us then into you know what I you know sort of tongue in cheek call the new blended model. And the reason I say it was a little bit of tongue in cheek is I believe that most learning designers have always had a blended approach. You know, you've had a pencil and a paper, you've had an audio tape uh, in a classroom, you've had you know, exercises. So what's different today is what we have to blend, not the fact that we are blending. Let's look at what some of those things are. So if you take a look at this slide, I call this learning enablers. I think we can agree that there's some formal enablers. You can read those on the left-hand side, synchronous and asynchronous. And then on the right, I, you know, I wish I could push that arrow all the way out. There's this huge area called informal. You know, chat, social networking, you, know, you send an, an instant message to someone, you get an email, they respond. You don't really, you weren't really thinking about it and you learn something. So there seems to be a big gap you're going to see in the next slide. The, the target that we have it's sort of that, that open area in between where formal and informal is. And we, as I said, we've got a lot of good ideas about formal activities. And there are all these informal things out there that sometimes we think are too informal, that you know, two people talking, how could we really design for that? So the question is, what, what sits in this middle? And I think that's the opportunity that I'm calling the new blended model. And we'll see there's a diagram that's going to come up, because I try to define that, what that is, in this four square model that uh, I adopted work that my colleague Marsha Connors has done. Marsha, by the way, has a book out with Tony Bingham on the new social learning. And if you look at this, we have formal and informal, and we have intentional and unintentional. Because it turns out that intentionality has a lot to do with learning. And you can see in the upper left quadrant, you have all those intentionally formal things, classes, seminars, all that good stuff. And in the upper right quadrant, you have all the wonderful projects, assignments, teamwork. In the lower right quadrant, you have play and search. And Let's highlight that lower left quadrant. That's where today we have the most opportunity to introduce new things in a blended way. Because this is where the technology is moving. This is sort of where the society is moving. We're doing many more things with informal tools, but with the same degree of intentionality. Because we're doing going there to learn something. It's not a random act. If we'll take a look at the, how that looks in this next slide. You'll see we're filling in in between the formal and the informal. You know, things like knowledge cast, mentoring, games, blogs, video logs, podcasts, video casts, communities of practice. What we're seeing is all the technology and tools available now are allowing us to really fill out this learning continuum. So as a learning
a designer, I think of it as an artist, you now have a palette of colors you've never had before, which allows you to design more effective learning for audiences, be more, and then have a, a better result. And so if we, we sort of step back from that, that and sort of focus in on that, we sort of, sort of circle those things that are there, and you know, we could add more things in there, because I think this is where we have a lot of the, the, new, the newer technologies and newer approaches are sort of growing. But now I want to abstract that out before I turn it over to Julian. Let's look at this next slide, because I think the linear model has some limits to it. And I love the Paul Klee quote there that's on your, on your screen, a line is the dot to win for a walk. You know, we're used to that one dimension, formal to informal. But my feeling was that really limited us. So here we have a formal dimension. You can see an informal dimension. If you really think about it, what most people are doing in their design today is they're moving into this third dimension. And I've been debating with my colleagues about what this third dimension is. Is it context? Is it social? Uh, but I hope some, maybe some people here on the webinar can actually help us evolve this as well, because I don't think anybody has come up with a definition. But the point is, we're no longer in a linear either-or world. When you go to design effective learning, I think you'll see this in Julie's examples, you, you can now design not only something that's informal, not only that's something that has informal, not only that's something that's mobile, that not only is something that is contextual, you can design with all of these facts and features, and therefore your solutions are going to be far more robust and, from what we know from our research, far more effective. So with that, I want to give, a, give an opportunity for Julie to talk some more about some of the specifics, and I'll come back in the Q&A, Darren, to answer some, any questions people have. I think Great, this really sort of sets the context for what we're going to hear next. Yes, yeah, so next, next we're going to move on to uh, the business case, but um, you know that that is going to be different, and the models and the blends that you that you select to use really are going to change depending on your audience. So, you know, perhaps if you're um, you know government or public sector uh, in, involved versus a high tech organization, you know the options of the delivery model that you have may may well you know vary tremendously. You know, um, it may be in a, a, a there's smartphones issued to a high-tech company, and you can get reach all their sales force through a mobile version, but perhaps in government it's not quite as easy, it's not quite as simple as that. So um, let's have a quick poll about the industries that are, that, that are represented here today. So we've got, uh, let's see, five options. There is a limit to the options, and I appreciate there's many, many, many other ones here as well, but um, let's take a look at those now. We've got government and public sector, manufacturing and operations, healthcare and medical, so kind of think life sciences under that, I guess. Uh, and then uh, high-tech software, I guess uh, high-tech hardware would be in there as well. And then other, which may well be a, the great unwashed. But let's kind of see where we're being represented from today. So let's take a look at those results. Okay, we've got about 6% of you in the, in, the, in the government public sector work, about 35% in manufacturing. Um, no representation from healthcare and medical today. Um, and about 24% from high-tech and software. And yet yeah, the great unwashed is, uh, is, is 30 35 percent as well as, as manufacturing. So strong presence in manufacturing and then a, a, a wide mix of, of others here today. So let's take a look at the business case. And you know, I appreciate you know, one of the conversations we had earlier, Julie, is that it, it, it does differ somewhat um, in, in, in where people are at. So, Well, currently, you know, a lot of people are using blended learning. Um, in the blended learning space, the majority of folks using it now are K-12, and higher ed, government and military, and then also the corporate space. And the corporate space encompasses a huge variety of right. different organizations, of course. Um, but as we saw from the poll, and then also the first question that we had earlier today is that a lot of people are using blended learning, and the trend is for that to continue. So why would people want to do that? Let's talk about some of the benefits of blended learning. Well, um, primary benefits, there are many, of course, but primary benefits are uh, cost reduction. You don't have to pay for anyone to travel except for, you know, essential face-to-face -face training components or those types of training, um, <clears throat> excuse me, subjects that would best be served face-to-face -face or something like that. Also, you can increase your reach and volume. So you can get those people who are in remote locations more easily engaged in the training and participating more in the training when they may not otherwise be. Think about folks that live in the far reaches of, you know, Siberia or something like that. If you have a blended approach that uses some multimedia type delivery methods, they may participate more than um, having to travel for days trying to get somewhere for some training. Um, 
Blended learning also helps you keep pace with the rapid changes in both training curriculum and technology. So it's easier to make changes um, to electronic training delivery methods than it is to face to face delivery methods. It's quicker to be done with fewer resources. The information is updated more quickly, like I said. But change something in a few files and you're good to go, rather than making sure that all your face to face trainers have updated their training materials and reprinted everything. Also, blended learning approach um, allows for more engaging learning environments. So you can then, if part of your blended learning approach is to have face to face training, you can focus that training more specifically on what you want the learner to take away, role play for sales scenarios or something like that, interactions and simulations, rather than lecturing on the history of dirt <laughs> training. Probably <laughs> all like that. <laughs> no, thanks, Liz. And also, you know, obviously with any benefits, I'm sure the challenges in this space that, the, that you've experienced and you've experienced with our clients. Absolutely. Um, learning new technology is one of the biggest challenges. We have five generations of learners in the workforce right now. so. Uh, there's a wide variety of different experience and expectations around training, so trying to get some of those older workers, uh, not to be stereotypical, can be more challenging for some of those folks to learn new technology and figure out how to IM and how to post something on a blog and mm. what's this Facebook thing all about. So getting people engaged with the new technology out there can be very challenging. Also then expecting your learners to adapt to a blended learning approach. Some people are very traditional and they want their training one certain way. And so giving them different, the same training experience with different modalities can be, can be hard for some folks. Um, also, obtaining support from upper management. Anytime there is a change, no matter what it might be, uh, it can be challenging, as you know, whether, even if it's going to save some money, still you have to manage the change, and that can be hard for people to adapt to. And then finding sufficient resources. So this can be a challenge for some organizations that particularly smaller organizations, if they have e-learning, for example, but they don't have in-house developers, making sure that they have quick access to develop a development team in order to update their training curriculum that's in a flash-based course, for example, can be, can be challenging. They have to pay for it or they have to figure out, teach that skill set to someone else that's in-house. And then one other interesting piece um, that is a challenge for the global audience is managing multiple languages. So a lot of organizations, need to localize and translate their, their content. Now, if you're pushing out content, it's easier. You can translate it before you push it out. But then there's all that social learning aspect that can be challenging a little bit, right, for a global audience. Yeah, you know, absolutely there is. You know, because, <clears throat> you know, to, to um, echo, you know, as Lance was saying, that the, the, the massive change and increase in, in just sheer volumes of data and information flow um, around with, you know, the, the, the new social media. Um, not everybody speaks every language <laughs> in the world, and you know uh, the Facebooks and the YouTubes that are, are localized into to many, many languages. Um, you know, coming originally from Europe, I I get uh, you know various Facebook messages that, that are in Swedish and in German and Italian, and I struggle to understand all those. You know, um, there's, there's some things that I do with obviously to get a gist of what's being being talked about, but it is definitely a challenge to really yeah. truly be engaged in those conversations. Something an organization needs to consider when they are doing any training program, whether it's blended or not, you still have to think about your global audience. Absolutely. So. Alrighty, so that's obviously one of the things that's going on. We've, we've, we've touched on some of the trends that we're seeing, you know, just the sheer volume of new technologies, new delivery mechanisms that are available to, uh, to, to, to both you know, educators and, and corporations and organizations to deliver this stuff. But, um, you know, do you talk us through some of those changes? All right, well, you know, um, some of the current stats are that 29% of organizations uh, plan to use a blended, blended learning approach if they are not. This is a, a global study. And then 31% plan to use online social networking. So that right there is telling us the way things are going, right? So it's apparent primary trends in blended learning are using social media and then new technology, um, the hardware around that new technology. So, a lot of that technology is obviously um, not exclusively, but is this a global phenomenon? Is this primarily European, Western European, or United States, North America? Is this? It is definitely global, but the trend is leaning towards Asia and Eastern Europe becoming rapidly ramping up to the rest of uh, North America and Western Europe. Right. So the trend is definitely they are catching up and they are really exploding in their use of uh, multiple delivery methods and social media as well. So they're definitely an audience that we need to consider. Great. Good.
So, um, social media, as everyone knows, uh, consists of a variety of things. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, virtual, it's all that informal learning that Lance uh, referred to earlier today. Uh, I would imagine everybody here on our list is, is familiar with all of those, using Twitter and Facebook and virtual environments and gaming, and then blogs, forms with these. All of those tools are out there, and there is no end to those. So those are a lot of the very successful tools that we can use. Um, the benefits of them, you know, most folks in the corporate space now are accustomed to them. If they don't necessarily use them at work, they're using them at home a lot of the time, or their kids are, and they can learn from their kids what it is, right? Um, so take advantage of that. The framework is there. Implementing it takes minimal financing. Facebook is free, so you can, you know, post some training there if you want, and you can make it uh, more private if you need to and whatnot as well. Um, so implementing some of those free services will mean, mean minimal financial impact for you, and also it benefits your learners who are already familiar with it and they know the interface and can adapt to it. And then it has been proven that people learn more when they're collaborating with their peers, um, and that's what social media is, all about collaborating with your peers. So take advantage of that. And you know, I, I know that from you know um, one of the companies we work with um, that's really looking at this whole e-collaboration space, uh, Jive Software. If you're familiar with those guys, um, <clears throat> you know, whether they have highly dispersed groups that need to work together. So you might have a product that you're developing in the United States. It's going to be produced, however, in China, and you have to have some sort of sort of mechanism for for folks that they're going to go market and sell and. Uh, position this, this, these, these products to collaborate together around the world. It's easier for people to collaborate when you have use a social media tool. You don't have to wait as much for um, a response to an email mm -hmm. because you're in different different time zones. And then you also can you get history. So one developer in Eastern Europe can then communicate with a developer in Asia who can communicate with a developer in North America, and they all get the same information at the same time, right. and they can talk back and forth and make sure that they're all doing what needs to be done in order to get everything wrapped up and finished. So that's great. Um, also then, let's talk just very briefly about the new technology that's out there. And I, when I say new technology, I don't mean some of the new social media sites, although those do rapidly change every day, but a lot of the hardware that goes along with it. Um, and we're at this place now where um, the demographics of workers are changing, um, as is the technology landscape. And so this is a prime opportunity for um, mobile learning and some other technological advances to enter the training space. Uh, so let's see. Mobile learning, obviously, is growing very, very quickly, right? So I think something that's, that's interesting there is, you know, we talk about mobile. Is any, any idea how many uh, people have mobile phones as a percentage of the uh, global population? It depends on the stats you look at. Sure. Uh, anywhere between, you know, 50 and 76 percent or so. Um, some of the stats are skewed a little bit because they count people that have you know, three mobile devices, for example. Right. Um, that does vary, of course, and depends on the, on the geographical location you're looking at. But um, also, a growing number of those individuals have data plans. So 20% right. of those people that have mobile devices have data plans. But the great thing about mobile learning is you don't necessarily need to have data plan or a smartphone in order to push out mobile learning. It's text messaging, and it's just as effective and gets out to your broader reach. Um, so, also gaming is, as everybody's been hearing for the last couple of years, a huge, huge way to um, integrate some training and by using gaming and online gaming, massive online gaming, really, if you want to get down to it. So you have multiple players in multiple locations playing games, you know. And instead of games for fun, they are for fun, but they also have a purpose in that learning. Um, augmented reality is another um, technological advance. A lot of mobile devices. Um, you, I would imagine some of you have heard of this, but you put your mobile device, shine it on a building, for example, on a street corner, and then more information about that building appears miraculously on your mobile device. It's a fantastic, great new technology, and it's um, definitely growing in its use and availability to others. Um, Ebooks and digital libraries, technology that's out there. You know, you've got your Kindle, you can push something out, or your iPad or iPod or iPhone or any of those devices. Um, so think about it though, people that are using these new technological advances have access to information regularly and constantly. 
they put their phones by their side, they have them on the table at restaurants, they walk down the street and they're looking at them, and then they trip on the curb. And, and so people are using their devices and taking them with them everywhere. Even if they don't have a handheld device, they still have these devices at their homes, at their work, in their car, wherever it might be. So there's a lot of access to information in multiple ways. All right, so let's um, talk then a little bit about what a blended learning program could include. So it can include a variety of items, um, but in 2011, the training community expects that blended learning will be uh, the primary delivery strategy employed in corporate training. So subjects will cover everything from new employee orientation to process sales to compliance training, whatever it is you need to have training on, it will be covered. Um, these are some examples of what a blended learning program could look like. You know, your specific program, though, depends on your business needs, the culture, expectations that you and the leadership come, leadership of the organization have, and also your technological capabilities. So you really need to think about, you know, does it make sense for your organization to employ a blended learning approach, and will it provide value? So you could have something, you know, a smaller blended learning approach might be an instructor-led training and a mobile learning component and an e-learning course, or it could include an e-book wiki, mobile learning, and an online simulation. Who knows? There are so many different delivery methods. Uh, really think about the design, as Lance mentioned earlier, and then what will um, help, what delivery method is best for that design and what you need to teach. So we have focused here at VIA Learning on product training. Um, blended training really blends well with product training, primarily because um, you can get just-in-time training for your sales staff. Um, or the people who have access to the product and they're selling it. Also, product tips, troubleshooting, if there's a problem with something, or if you discover a new way to use something, you can send it out quickly and easily in a blended approach. Also, reinforcing sales scenarios and simulations, providing on-the-job training in a blended learning approach, and um, then reference sheets and whatnot as well. So it's really a blended learning for product training is a cost-effective and efficient way to your sales staff. Um. We have a question that's just, just coming in as well, so now my answer might be a, be a good way, good point to address that is, you know, what, what is M learning? People have heard oh, of this M learning yes. business, and how does that relate to all of this? Yes, M learning is short for mobile learning, like e learning is short for electronic learning. So using your mobile device or <coughs> phone for um, training and learning, and it's interesting somebody would ask that now because we are going to talk about that here. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Perfect timing. Someone have my, my notes here? <laughs> so so as, we get, as we get to this, you know, let's, let's, let's take a look at um, you know, something that we worked with as an organization on that was considered a pretty successful blended learning approach that, that um, also incorporated this mm -hmm. M learning piece. Um, so this, this particular organization really had a, you know, a highly dispersed workforce um, across the United States and was looking for you know, something more of a non-traditional approach so they could reach these folks without having to drag, you know, thousands of people into into individual groups, small groups, classrooms, that sort of thing. So yes. I was going to talk us through what we did there. You bet. So we were fortunate enough to um, work with risk management here just a couple of months ago, and they have thousands of employees nationwide. They have um, a, few thousand, a few thousand of them in sales. They, had, they currently use a web-based training program and have an LMS, and that's been very successful for them. It was challenging, though, for the sales team, Darren, like you said, because they were dispersed and they were all over the country, and um, it was a little more challenging for them to complete all their required training because they do work in the field, and they don't always sit down and have access to the laptop and, or desktop PC and take their web-based training. Um, so there was a need to reach the remote sales team for some product training. So we um, partnered with Waste Management and came up with a blended approach. This blended approach consisted of one e-learning course and then two short mobile courses. Um, one of the courses was very product specific, so exactly information about that specific product. And then the other one was sales training specific, so what kind of questions your customers might ask and then how to respond to that. Each one was approximately three minutes long, didn't have any audio, provided for easy navigation, and they were easily able to reach the remote sales team because they were delivered over the mobile device. Um, and the learners actually could take their e-learning e course over the mobile device too if they wanted to, but it wasn't designed as such. So. Um, I'm going to show you a few screenshots here of what exactly we did. So um, here's one. This is the launch page. And then some information on the course and then the menu as well. So the learners could 
go through and figure out what subject they wanted to um, proceed through next. Remind folks as well as we go through this, you know, please do feel free to ask um, you know, questions as we, as we go. We'll, we're, we're saving some for the end, but we can also address some if you have just specific ones. We can address those as we go too. Great. Thank you, Darren. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, customer interaction. So we have questions, general information and in the sales course. And then uh, just some general text information there and an image so you can see what uh, images would look like on the Blackberry. Another image that was in the courseware. And then lastly, some general information and um, some graphical representation to help get some context to the training. So was this successful? Yes, we believe that it was successful. Um, their training objectives were met with this blended learning approach because they could get out to those remote sales teams. Um, more success in completing courseware. And while I don't have the specific stats around it, um, it's highly believed by the leadership team that this will be a very successful course and program for them. And immediate information was given out to the sales team. And the employee current technology that their remote sales course was, was moving out. Okay. So one, one, of the, one of the questions that we have um, coming in here as well is, um, you know, this one specifically went to a certain mobile devices, mm -hmm. and you know, I know that in, in, in our other projects there's, there's challenges with different mobile devices and getting the same thing to work on different devices yep. can, be, can be difficult. Um, so you can, perhaps you can talk a little bit to that and then also the, the, the devices that we, that we can do support. You bet. So some of the challenges, that also is perfect timing too, that we did have some challenges with the, rolling out that blended learning program. And that had to do, we used a specific mobile platform. Uh, we delivered this course on the BlackBerry. And BlackBerry has multiple operating systems that mm -hmm. are still in use. And so when you develop for mobile devices, no matter what it is, whether it's a BlackBerry or an iPhone or an iPad or any other type of smartphone or mobile device, you really need to know what operating system you're going to be using on so you can design and deliver appropriate content on, on that. So for example, in this particular project, we did struggle some because not all of the Blackberries were the latest ones out in the market. So right. you have one that's one or two years old and the operating system doesn't have um, graphics automatically appear, for example. So you have to, the learner has to go in and turn them on, which is a little frustrating for learners because you don't always know how to do that. Um, so we really we had to redesign that. No, that's, that's, that, that, that's a great point. And I think again, to be honest with the questions, but you know, I, I think you know one of the things we should, you've heard stressed here a lot today is that <clears throat> the technology is, is changing. And it's not just that there's new devices, new ways of delivering this, but even the devices themselves are changing very, very rapidly with both um, you know feature sets, capabilities, um, the operating systems that they reside on themselves are in rapid, rapid change right now. Um, and I, I think that sets to stay the same over the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. I don't, I don't see that changing anytime it's, soon. And it's really not. We, we built this to be delivered over a web page so that we could try and um, limit some of the risks and the challenges that we were coming up against. But it really depends on the browser that the mobile device uses and what features of that browser that they um, automatically enable and, and allow. Also, tracking and reporting is a big challenge. You know, we have high hopes that um, we would be able to track, and I know waste management did as well, we really wanted to track hmm. the using of the course. That has been a challenge. Um, the LMS hasn't allowed for much tracking with the mobile course. It's been a challenge for, for us to work through that. And um, so. Yeah, I think that's, that. uh, you know, there's, there's, there's various um, uh, LMS, you know, as everyone will know, and they're, they're you know, lesser and greater extent in, the, in their support for mobile, but um, you know, so far, I'd be interested to get some information from anybody in the audience that has the answer of which one they feel is actually the best that can support mobile, because there, there is limitations within all of those, simply because the technology is changing so rapidly, it's hard to actually write programs and write code to support that. And there that are change. some um, great LMS tools out there that are designed specifically for mobile devices, mm -hmm. um, and they are up and coming very quickly. Um, I know Cellcast is one that does work specifically for BlackBerry, so okay. that's a great one to, to reference. Good. Uh, we did have a question come in about the difference between mLearning and then just a web page that has navigation to Word docs. Well, that would be a web page with navigation to Word docs would be a way to uh, disperse some mobile learning. So that is a type of mobile learning. Um, some mobile learning still can be much more interactive, have multiple choice questions, 
So depending on the amount of interactivity you want to have in your training, that would be the difference. Good. Okay. So, just to you know, please keep questions coming in. We did. We you know, I have it. We have added time for for, for Q and A. We have several questions. If we haven't got to yours yet, I apologize. We will. We will get to it very very shortly. But just to kind of summarize kind of where we where we were today. So, you know, I, I think it, I think it's clear from both you know the information that both Lance and Julie had had shared. You know, the technology is 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 there. The delivery mechanisms are there. There's more delivery mechanisms in five years' time. I'm sure there'll be a delivery mechanism that we haven't even considered here today. Um, but that's that's where training's headed. It's, it really is the direction that increasingly um, the blended learning approach is, is really going to do. And then increasingly having some sort of social media um, as, as part of that blended learning, you want to encourage collaboration and discussion on you know the key points of, of, of that of that learning experience. And, and also it can serve as a really great feedback loop as well that you can become involved in. And then oftentimes we find, you know, specifically calling this out as of a right now, that sales teams are really getting a significant benefit from getting the product information in a blended format. You know, you don't have to go back that many years when, you know, you fly your entire global sales force into one location to teach them the next product and the positioning and how to sell it, whereas now we can really start to, to reach out in different ways and in, in a constant um, way as well. It's not just a one single one-time event. You can continuously update as, as new features come out, maybe new features that you're working on in, a, in an agile software environment. There's a lot of new stuff and, 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 and new, new ways to reach that information out there. So, Good. So let's um, look into some of the, uh, the, the, the questions that we, we, we've received. Um, one of the questions, I'll open this up to but, you know, both Lance and Julius, have, both of you are in on this, but how do you utilize um, mobile learning and integrate it with web-based training? So, Julie, why don't, why don't we start well, with you? As a complement or totally independent. Um, you can create an e-learning course and then bookend it with mobile learning um, materials or courseware. You know, mobile learning can be a wide variety of things. It can be pushing out a text message about, hey, you know, go check out this new resource that we have downloadable on our internet site or it could be um, actually giving out product information or training tips or tips of the day, whatever it might be. And you can refer back and forth to each component. So your mobile learning can component, component can say, hey, refer to this e-learning course, and your e-learning course can say, in the next mobile learning component, you're going to learn A, B, C, whatever mm. it might be. So you can use them together or totally separate. Okay. Lance, would you, would you have anything to, to, to add to, to Julie's yeah, comments there? Again, it's, what we're talking about here is these, it's these words that people put definitions on. Mobile learning is a misnomer because it could be mobile, mobile performance support, mobile reference, mobile text, mobile. I think that as Julie was pointing out again, back to the point about design, you can use, depending if, if you're using a webinar or a web-based training of some kind and you have a mobile audience, then you design some interaction that would leverage the mobile device. Um, and I think Julie's giving some good examples. I think it could be a test, it could be a piece of information, it could be a text network that you set up. So I think this goes back to the point we were making before, which is designers today have more tools to design with. And you should start with what will make your design better and then look at the tool, not start with the mobile tool and then figure out what to do with it. I think, it's, I think it's a great point, yeah, so, you know, really start with those instructional designers and the understanding of what the message is and then work out the best way to deliver that, that message or learning event or experience. Good. So, related into that is, you know, we sparked several questions. I'm going to lump these in together, and my, my apologies to any individuals if, if there was a specific point on this um, that, that you wanted to address. We can either address it afterwards or, or, or please um, add to your, to your existing questions. But we're getting quite a few people talking about, you know, how do we, to summarize the various ones, how do we really use social media in training? You know, that's, that's obviously something we, you know, everybody's moving towards and talking about. So perhaps, Julie, you know, what, what have you seen done? What well, ideas do you some great ways to use social media are to post questions and even just have the various people respond to them, right? So you can say, okay, here's my... Um, speaking of product training, I'm going out and I'm going to sell a printer to ABC company. Anybody have any sales tips that I could try? Historically, this customer has not purchased any printers from us. Right. And then get some new information and sales tips from your peers that way. Okay. So you post something on a blog or a wiki or you know, even send out a message over a mobile device, whatever it might be. And then 
that question has been posed, peers are responding to that and giving some new advice. The person who asked that question is learning some new sales tips and techniques, and the people that are answering the question are reaffirming the tips and techniques that they know. And also then maybe getting some other ones that have been posted as well, getting some new advice. So that's some of the informal, unintentional learning that, that happens. Right. Um, this, this, this can really, really help in what a lot of organizations call that kind of tribal knowledge mm -hmm. and Absolutely. dispersing that through your organization. Absolutely. Darren, if I could add on to that, again, again, social media, I think Julie was giving a great example in a sales situation where uh, you could use a social network and, you know, Facebook or not, it doesn't matter, uh, to connect all the salespeople so that they are keeping each other abreast of what they're doing. So there's, there's just like a status report, just like you have status. They could be posting documents and then linking them, as, as Julie was pointing out, to a, another technology, a blog or a wiki that they therefore could share sales stories. They could use something like Skype even for a conference calling from their laptop to their mobile phone. So I think, again, when we come back to what would make a salesperson more effective, the social media tools are those kind of tools that allow them to connect up with other people. That's the basis of them. To connect up with other people and to get to that, not only the tribal knowledge, the tribal artifacts. I right. mean, that, that really is the, the difference in the social media. So it's not just talking, you actually get to physical things as well. Right, good. And then there's related related to that, but I, but I think it does does involve a different challenge, which we we, we, we did touch on briefly was um, incorporating that social media and uh, mobile learning, but for, for a global audience. Mm -hmm. You know, how does how does how does that work when you've got you know folks all around the world and and, and looking at that and, and to touch base and answer some of that for for our folks in the audience. It's the, the kind of volume of data that's been created with the, you know, the advent of social media, and there's various stats on this, and I'm, I'm sure you guys know them better than I do, but you know, it's, it, it's said that there's, there's, there's more data created in the last 12 months than there had been in the previous X many years. You know, so localizing all this stuff in a traditional model is, is, is really hard. You know, so you know, having a team in China that doesn't speak English and a team in the United States that doesn't speak Chinese can introduce some some challenges in, in the, uh, the localization industry. Um, be a language um, is involved in. Uh, it's currently looking into it exactly that. You know, how do we solve this? You know, what what uses of machine translation can we use? And then, you know, can this then be edited quickly and easily by, by humans so they can then be be made available? And obviously, you've seen other things like the Google Translate type approach as well. Yeah, and that becomes a challenge when it comes into the informal learning and, and mm -hmm. user posted content and user created content. You know, if an organization is rolling out a global blended learning program, then they have control over what content they push out and what languages they push it out in. Mm -hmm. And they can choose if they'll push it out in English and all these other languages or just in Chinese, for example, or whatever it might be. But they're, that's definitely swirling around in the training community right now. It's a big challenge. Yeah, it is. You know, and, uh, certainly one of, the, one of the previous webinars um, that, that we've done, we actually looked at um, Wikipedia. And uh, you know some of the stats that came up. Just if you go to the Wikipedia front page, um, it'll tell you how many documents and, and how many articles are available in English and various other languages. And obviously, the various other languages completely, you know, um, dwarf the, the English-only content. So it's, you know, and there's a lot of great information. People do use that as a as a starting point to to, to educate themselves on a new area or issue. It can be a little overwhelming for people to think about. All right, good. So a quick one here for you. Um, what's the difference between a blog and a, and a vlog or a vlog? <laughs> I guess I put that up. I mean, the, again, I, I hate terms. So a blog has been a, a written document, and a, a vlog, a video log, is the, the classic one is YouTube. And many companies uh, either are having their own YouTube channel or are using short videos as a way to share information. And so, again, it's one of those unfortunate labels of... Uh, what do you call a video posting? Um, so I think that where it's been used most in the product trading, again, is where people want to uh, show a person giving a presentation. They're trying to demonstrate a product, so they want to embed a short video. Uh, and so it's just a, it's a way, it's a term that refers to doing that in some kind of training program. Good, no, no, th thanks. Ed. And yeah, I, I think I think it is difficult with, with you know, and I, I, I agree with you that the whole labeling thing. Um, because I'm gonna, I, I understand a lot of folks really got to have some sort of label, so we're all you know talking in the same language. I guess I don't know if you have any viewpoints on that, Lance. Well, I think that's a great 
Well, right. I think, yes, I do. I mean, again, having been in the industry 30 years and seen a lot of, of these buzzwords flow by, right. <laughs> a lot of what I've tried to do today, and I constantly try and get people to do is don't get seduced by the buzzword. Think about the problem you're trying to solve, the characteristics of that problem, which includes the content, the, the audience, the complexity, and then, like a good architect, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright is my, my hero, you know, a good architect then looks at all the materials available to them today to solve that problem. And I think one of the things that you're seeing is, again, today we have the ability to share videos, we have the ability for people to post, we have the ability for people to send informal connections, we have the ability for people to have profiles, um, you have the ability to post all sorts of different kinds of content, you have the ability to build deep interactions, simulation games. So a, a learning designer today, I mean, in my, in my opinion, it's just it's a wonderful lot, set of opportunities because the, the amount of choices or the number of choices a person has to solve problems allow us, allow us to be much more um, effective in those solutions because we can more tailor the solution to what the real problem characteristics are. And I think that's where each of these terms only helps us when we're describing a tool we're going to use. Great. No, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, one question that came in, I believe this, this one actually came in while we were looking at the, um, the work that VIA Learning had done for waste management. So perhaps I can address this one to, uh, to you, Julie. And then, you know, last we'll definitely have you chip in as well from, from your experience. And so a couple of things to this. One is, you know, if, if, if you make um, the learning or the content available um, by mobile phone, is it cost justified to purchase devices for everyone? So that was the first part of the question. The second part was with, with waste management specifically, is, you know, did they already have those devices? Yeah, waste management already had those devices, and um, not all of them were paid for by the company. Um, some people use them on their own. You know, it really depends on the company and your philosophy and how you want to do your expenses, if you right. pay for them or not. Um, some ways to get around it are to not make the mobile learning required. So it can be purely volunteer. If my company pushes out mobile learning and I want to take it, then that's up to me. It's not something that I have to I have to do right. um, unless the company pays for it. You know, some companies don't want to pay for devices, which is within their right. They sure. Don't have to, but that's when you can't really make it required legally. <laughs> it really depends on the company. So I think that you know, and, and, and to that, you know, when when you look at. Um, that avenue for either promoting or for bookending, as you talked about. Um, you know, it's also, and, and to last point as well, you know, think about the audience and whether that device um, or that delivery mechanism is correct for that audience. Right. So, you know, if you do have a dispersed sales team, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to have, as part of their job requirement, you know, right. some form of communication device for, for when they're out in the field. Um, but your call center and customer service reps may not. Yeah. So mobile learning may not be the best choice for them. That's a great point. I think, I think Darren, just to jump on, I think the most interesting thing has been the, the, again, not to promote Apple, but as the iPad has come out, now you're actually seeing some organizations buying the technology to help them solve the problem. Right. So where I think Julie's right, you know, people have mobile phones that they don't. It's sort of hard to argue you, know, you should buy them or not. I think there are some new mobile devices coming out where organizations are making the decision to purchase the device because it allows people not to learn, but to perform their jobs, and, and then also be able to embed some learning on that. So that's the only time I've ever seen organizations buy a new device uh, when they see that the opportunity around that device is greater than just learning. I've never seen a device bought just for learning. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. It can be, it can be augmented as, as, as part of a reasoning, but isn't necessarily the, the sole reason. Right. Um, Fortunately, we're actually out of time. I do apologize if there are any audio issues that, that, that some of you um, have experienced. Uh, I understand there were one or two. Um, there's further information available. Um, we'd like to just quickly show those as well so that you can um, see those. I'd like to thank, obviously, Julie Brink and uh, Lars Dublin um, for, for, for their assistance. You can download this, uh, this webinar and presentation that is available um, at the viaLearning.com site. Um, we will look to see if we can get the audio fixed from that if there is anything there that, 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 that you're really interested in. And finally, thank you very much indeed to our audience. Um, a lot of really good interaction there. We're, we're very, very pleased to, to, to see that level of interaction. And if we didn't get to your question, I do apologize. We will look to follow up to, uh, to the individuals that ask those questions. And um, obviously, feel free to, to, to contact us should you have any, any follow-up questions as well. And I do want to point out uh, Lance's website on this 
spec here is incorrect. It should be .net instead of .com. We'll correct it before we send the, the, the version out to everyone. Great. So that's www.southernconsulting.net. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you all very much for your attendance and participation. We look forward to, uh, to speaking with you again um, at, at the next uh, deal learning webinar. Thank you. Thank you.